Welcome to Liquid Margins. This is sharing the page, building community with annotation. Today's guest, Haley Stefan, visiting assistant professor of multi-ethnic and Latinx literature from the College of the Holy Cross. Arun Jacob, PhD student in the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto. Andy Boyles Peterson, digital scholarship librarian at Michigan State University. And today's moderator is Nate Angel. He's the director of marketing at Hypothesis. And I'm your host, Franny French. And I wanna thank you all for being here. And I'm gonna shut up now and I'm gonna turn it over to Nate. And thank you so much. Thanks, Franny. And uh, <clears throat> really uh, so excited to have y'all here. Um, this is a topic area that I'm really personally um, kind of committed to and interested in, so I'm interested in, and so uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation today. And um, <clears throat> as we get started here, I think one of the things that might help our audience best, and also um, as we're recording this for posterity, is if one of you guys could kind of describe to us um, the community that you participate in and kind of what its interests and goals are so we can get an idea of sort of like where you're coming from uh, in your use of social annotation. I don't know who's the best person to take that question. I guess I can give kind of a, a super brief overview of, of what DH Reads is, what we do. Um, so we've had DH Reads going for the past couple years uh, and we're planning on keeping that going in the future. And basically every month over the summer from May through August, we look at a digital humanities piece that has been published over the past year. And that's published not necessarily calendar year, but basically summer to summer. Then using hypothesis, we end up annotating and then kind of chatting about discussing that text. At the end of each month, we then kind of pair that annotation with a two hour Twitter conversation using the hashtag DHreads where we really kind of delve in a little bit more and explore the annotations that we had over the past month. Uh, this year, pairing with that, during the first year, we just had looking at a DH piece that had been published. Uh, this year, we added a digital project component uh, where we kind of paired a related digital project to each month's readings uh, and then kind of annotated that with Hypothesis as well. Arun or Haley, do you have any other comments on, on what we do or? I think that covered everything. It was a fantastic way of getting together, especially during the pandemic. Yeah. And you know, uh, let me uh, do a follow up then and maybe Arun or, or Haley could, could take this one. Um, you know, for the uninitiated, when you hear this term digital humanities, right? I mean, I have an idea sort of of what it means and what it encompasses, but how do, how do you guys think about digital humanities? How would you describe it as someone who's unfamiliar with the term? The, the definition I'd like I work off of is uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick has this definition and which I have like botched and turned into, you can do digital things to analog I mean, you can do digital stuff to the analog things or analog thing, uh, stuff to digital things. So what a traditional humanist would do, we do that. The object of analysis could be a digital text, could be a digital, I mean, whatever, or it could be the other way where the object could be an analog object. It could be an old book or something. And we do analytics, which is of the digital nature. So either or. Got it. So it's sort of like um, exploring both sides of the terms there, the, the digital and the humanity side. Got it. So Haley, I saw you unmute. Um, it would also be great if, could you give us a couple examples of some digital humanities projects that you love? <laughs> Absolutely. There are a lot, as Arun was kind of pointing out, it's a large umbrella that it covers here. I think about some of the really exciting projects that we're seeing right now, as kind of Arun was pointing towards here, are digitizing, um, some really great older texts, making things open access, really widening the way that we understand teaching and learning. But there's also some exciting projects happening in things like text mining, figuring out across large corpuses or groups of text, how language is being used, how it evolves, as well as thinking about more things like material objects, 
So there are projects like the Asylum Suitcase Project, the name of which I've just botched, but I'll throw the link in the chat here, where they open up these left behind luggages, left behind materials um, from folks who are in, or were rather institutionalized to kind of showcase what does this look like, kind of make these histories more legible to a wider range of people and try to think about what we can do with material objects in digital space too. And that's, I'm really starting to get a picture of it now. Um, and it's kind of hooks back into some memories of, I used to be a, an academic back in the day myself and uh, <laughs> fiddled on the edges of these margins when they were first maybe being explored. Um, so, and uh, what, so you have this, this community, DH Reads, that focuses on, uh, you know, kind of, it sounds like exploring these digital humanities projects, um, to, like together as a community. Who, who makes up that community? How big is it? How often do you get together, if you will, uh, which is probably different than actually meeting face to face, I imagine. So I, I think I, I can chime in on this. Arun, you've been here for a couple years. So if you have comments uh, on it, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts or Haley as well. Um, over the past couple years, our DH Reads community has shifted a little bit. The first year uh, when, when we kind of first started this up, uh, so often our faculty uh, and students and everyone else, it hits the summer and we lose so many people. And you have those relationships where you're still maybe emailing with folks or you're working on kind of big projects, but at least for us librarians, we're oftentimes still in the library and we're working away. And I wanted to kind of maintain those contacts with uh, other folks uh, at Michigan State who had kind of kind of scattered out and gone to the wind to go work on their uh, their own separate separate projects and such. And so DH Reads was a way for at least once a month us to kind of get together and talk and look at something relevant and really kind of delve in. And that first year we had mainly Michigan Staters uh, who were there in the DH Reads community, along with Arun joined us and a few folks that we're friends with on Twitter and such uh, who kind of pulled in. Uh, this second year uh, ended up advertising it a little bit more broadly uh, using uh, largely the Digital Humanities Summer Institute listserv as well as a couple other DH listservs and that I was very, very excited. We ended up bringing in uh, a lot more individuals from kind of all areas of the country and uh, in Canada as well. So. so, so Haley, did I take from? Oh, sorry, Arun, you you unmuted. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the way I would say it is like after the post conference rush that we'd have in the summer, then there's this radio silence, and DH reads was like the ideal kind of activity to like make up for that radio silence. And it was like the, the energy that you came back with to work on at your home institutions and all of a sudden it's like, oops. <laughs> and, and that like, you know, talking things through, thinking things through and being able to do that. That was what DH Reads as, as a community, I mean, provided most for, you know, solo flying <laughs> researchers at, at their own home institutions. It was a sense of getting to, yeah, bounce ideas off of each other and yeah, that sense of community was developed in that sort of way. Got it. That sounds really good. And, and Haley, I'm just I'm surmising from all this that maybe of the three of you, you're you're possibly the newest member of DH Reads. So how did how did you get interested in it, and how did it connect to your your like digital humanities scholarship? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm definitely the newest. Um, I think. I came at this from a couple different angles, one being the Digital Humanities Summer Institute um, listserv that I get via email. I know I had already followed Arun on Twitter as I was going to be attending his workshop this coming summer. That'll be happening in a little bit of a different format now. Uh, but I'm also the outreach coordinator for the Digital Americanists group through the American Literature Association. And part of my job for that is to research what's happening in digital humanities and highlight it on that Twitter account. So I was doing a little bit of that work, came across this reading group, shared the link and thought, this is something that I want to be a part of. And, and did it, does it, how does it connect to your own scholarship and work? Do you, do you have digital humanities things of your own going on that 
resonate with it? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of my work is in disability and race um, and thinking about how that works in both to use kind of rooms where they're like the analog and digital spaces. And so I've been learning a lot from this group. I wasn't formally trained in my graduate career in the digital humanities. So I think like many of us, I'm kind of coming at this from a variety of different angles and trying to learn on my way there. The Digital Humanities Summer Institute that Andy just shared on the link or on the chat here um, is one way that I've participated in that. And a lot of it is learning from other scholars like Arun and Andy and all the folks in DH Reads. Well, that, I mean, I feel like I, I got a better background now of, of what it means to be a part of DH Reads. Um, look, maybe, uh, and I don't know if this is a, a good question for Arun or Andy, but um, could you just uh, sketch out for us how social annotation is involved in the practices of DH Reads and, and kind of how you're using social annotation as part of your community work? I think the way I, I take it is like going off of what uh, Jeremiah Keller is writing about, like, you know, annotation as first draft thinking. And, and that is, is kind of what I, I found the most interesting. It's, it's like marginalia is usually stuff that's going on in my head and it's a conversation you have with yourself and the text. Whereas here you get to bounce those, you know, am I reading this right? questions that you have to yourself with other people who's along with it. So there's this collective effervescence that comes from, you know, using it that, that I find is the most enriching part about uh, reading it that way. I really love that term collective effervescence. Um, maybe Andy was maybe going to pick up on that too. I was going to say, Basically what Haley said in the chat, that's a wonderful way to put it, Arun. Uh, I've really loved with Hypothesis that we've been able to have kind of some of those preliminary conversations, uh, really flesh things out and discuss things. And then I've been a part of groups before where we've just had Twitter chats and those can be great, but oftentimes you're only really getting at that first level. And using Hypothesis, we're really able to get to that first level and then kind of take it to the next level in our Twitter chat. And then sometimes we'll even bring it back and folks will go back after the Twitter chat and make more annotations, put links in, do different things. And so we really get a lot of depth that I, I'm not sure that we would get otherwise. Yeah, that's really interesting. So it goes all the way from that first draft thinking uh, that Arun was mentioning. Um, or maybe it was Haley, now I've already lost track, um, and uh, all the way into like a, a second or third pass at the material where you're adding a kind of layers of extra information onto the work. At that point, it then becomes like a critical fandom where it's like, you know, like, you know, how fans would discuss in, in, a, in a fan website, it'll be like, oh yeah, this person said this, and then you tack it onto it. So there it's scholarly, but it has another more, I mean, we've had this conversation together and you're building on it in a fan-like way. So that's, that's another way. I'd I like that. And I suppose there's a lot of great digital humanities work going on in, in fandom as well. Haley, you unmuted. I was just going to kind of extend what Arun was saying here. It really is like a critical fandom. I mean, our Twitter chats are filled with memes and GIFs and a variety of kind of chatting back and forth. And the fun part about Hypothesis is we can do that there too. So things are linked across these two sites. We're kind of speaking both within them and across them. We come back to them, as Andy said. We've then kind of compiled a list of all these sources that we've read to kind of keep building off them, keep learning from each other. Um, and I think that's been what's really neat about this is that these conversations are happening in multiple spaces and can be asynchronous, which has been really useful. Yeah, one of the ways that I often end up thinking about um, social annotation is, is that it really takes the, what has heretofore been a more lonely process, like Arun was describing, of, of reading and having a conversation by yourself with the text and then expanding that out to a social a social dimension where it kind of turns your reading into a, a social event. Do you, would you, that sounds like what you guys are describing. And I'm wondering, do you think it fundamentally changes the nature of reading itself to have it have that social dimension? I don't know who wants to, to take that one. No one, maybe. I could take that. 
or unless everyone, do you want to go ahead? <laughs> I, I would say yes, absolutely. I mean, I think coming at it from a teaching perspective, and Andy, I'd love to hear this perspective from you after too, kind of thinking about it from the library side. Um, so much, I think, <laughs> sorry to put you on the spot. So much I think of reading is that moment, like Arun said, of happening kind of in your head, figuring out whether you're digesting something, I don't want to say correctly, but maybe in the way that the author attend, intended you to get it. And teaching, I think, is, is really kind of doing that move of, of holding a mirror up to the class, um, to borrow a phrase from a critic whose name I'm forgetting awfully, and, and help them understand what they're thinking, help them kind of work through all those miscellaneous threads and put them together. And I think hypothesis kind of allows you to do that, allows you to kind of bring those voices together, work through them. Um, so I do think there is something vital that happens when you're having these conversations in live time, in a sense, while you're reading. I think that changes it entirely. And as a reading group, it was like a close-knit community. It was intimate enough. And it was a place where it, we could be engaged in like vulnerable reading and like vulnerable annotations in the sense it's like, you know, there it, it's uh, putting in your ideas, which you're not sure out there in, in the thing and like sharing it with these people. So that creates a safe I mean, space for thinking through your thoughts and ideas. And I mean, this was what I was thinking of uh, as I was thinking of how to implement this in a classroom setting. It's like how to bring, you know, this as a teachable moment. It's, it's like, if we're going to be living in a world where people are going to chat with each other and common threads are a part of social discourse, as a teaching practice, like this allows people how to be, how to engage in civic discourse in chat threads. And, and those are the kind of thoughts and ideas I was thinking through about how, you know, uh, as a teachable practice, how to conceive of, of what we do here. Yeah, that really that really makes sense. And so, I mean, this is obviously a kind of um, professional development kind of experience the DH reads in general. Although, obviously, you've got people from all different kind of um, ranges of the academic life, all the way from librarians to grad students and and then and, and teachers and so forth. And you're all teaching too, I'm sure. And I, I really wanted to pick up on that idea that you were putting out, Arun, about. Um, uh, the experience that you have professionally using um, something like social annotation uh, and kind of exploring it yourself, not as a teacher necessarily, but almost as a student, right? Or as a, as a reader, as a scholar, let's say. And then using that as a hinge to think about how one might incorporate it into your teaching as, a, as an experience for for your students. And I'm wondering, I feel like uh, when educational technology is brought into our, our teaching and learning experiences, a lot of times that step isn't taken where the teachers themselves kind of deeply experience the affordances of either the tool or the pedagogy or whatever it is before they then experiment on their students with it. Um, is that, it seems like you were kind of getting at that, Arun. Yeah, and and I think that, that kind of, speaks to uh, institutionally, if you think about the professoriate or such, uh, the professor lives in a space between, like that has come from the priesthood. And now that's not the case. It, they have to be more so with the programmer. So they're, the priestly connections are leaving and now we have to be more programmerly in our interactions. And it's a way of thinking about how ed tech has to be a, coming into the classroom with the pedagogue in the driver's seat. So how is this learning technology, uh, what is the critical pedagogical value that it places rather than uh, a CTO or someone who's driving the decision-making of why is it that we're using this learning management system? And that is what this as a, a learning technology allows for us to do. It's like, okay, we can, the affordances that, that we have to take into consideration, I guess that's what it allows. To kind of build off that too, I think it it kind of breaks down that power structure just a little bit, not fully, between the instructor and the student. When you're doing things like taking part in these live so social annotation moments, you know, I think we kind of, as instructors, imagine that when we're commenting on drafts and writing comments on the 
in the margins that somebody is going to respond back to that or that they're going to get a kick out of, you know, the mini joke that I leave there. I, I'm sure they do. But when you're doing it on hypothesis or, you know, kind of engaging in these things like Twitter, where they can respond and you're reading alongside them, I think it, you know, you're more human to them. You're picking up on the jokes. You're confused at the same time as them. You're looking up things, linking in new ideas. So I think that kind of destabilizing the power dynamic also makes learning a little bit less scary, maybe more accessible. And, and to build off of what Haley is saying, it's like my annotations uh, happen to be GIFs. They happen to be song lyrics. They happen to be screenshots. It's not just static text that is showing up as an annotation. And since Hypothesis allows for it, I go full throttle and put everything that I find works in there. And that makes for a lively conversation. And Andy, I, we haven't let you talk for a while. And I was also wondering, you, you may have something to say on those lines, but I also thought, you know, given your role as a librarian, are you, do you feel like this kind of social annotation revolution, let's call it, um, is changing people's relationships to books at all in any interesting ways? Wow, that's a, that's a doozy of a question. My goodness. Um, I think, uh, I think that really kind of ties in with, uh, with what we've been talking about, uh, where like, yes, I, I do think this changes the way that folks interact with, uh, with a text or interact with a, with a book or interact with their classes with a textbook as I, particularly in the classroom, uh, but elsewhere in a reading group, uh, et cetera, everyone, every student is an absolute expert on their own lived experiences. And they're bringing that into their reading of a text and having the opportunity to read that alongside them and hear their different perspectives, their different takeaways, what is uh, objectively important to them, what points they're like having challenges with, uh, I think that's huge and it brings so much depth and range to uh, the reading of a text and the understanding of a text uh, and just kind of using a text in both in the classroom and in, in life. So I'm not sure if that's necessarily with, uh, with all library texts, but uh, I, I do think that uh, is, yeah, I think that's changing the way that we read. And, Go ahead, Arun. Uh, and on the other hand, I mean, it, th there's also another aspect to it, which is accountability in the sense that if you've been assigned a reading, you have to come with the receipts. <laughs> it's like everybody else can see what you have done in terms of reading and as, as a, and like, you know, what your th thoughts are. You can't like, you know, weasel your way out of it. And, and, and which is something that in classroom settings makes it, you know, makes it interesting. I don't want it to use it as a cop technology, but it it allows you to see it's like, okay, who got stuff, who didn't get stuff. That, that, that kind of yeah, and there's so many ways that, you know, teachers have long tried to figure out if people are doing the reading, right? Not because they want to be cops, like you say, but because they feel like the learning is going to happen if people are focused on the text, right? <laughs> um, and so, you know, like the reading quizzes and the, you know, the papers where you just regurgitate cliff notes and all those things that really do don't seem like they contribute as authentically to the learning experience as this kind of social annotation does. But I think what you're saying, Arun, is that it also leaves a trail of kind of, let's not say accountability, but a record of your passage through the text as a reader. That's really interesting. You know, the other thing that's come to mind here, going back to the digital uh, humanities side of all your work, and, and Arun, if you want to say something, yeah, I'll give you that mic in just a sec, but maybe you could think about this too. Um, there's a way in which the annotations themselves then kind of become a secondary or tertiary text uh, that, um, I mean, each one has its own distinct URL. It kind of exists as a scholarly object on its own as an annotation. And so it's um, not to, it's kind of turtles all the way down here, but there's like text on text on text. And I'm wondering if you guys have thought about that or explored that um, kind of the palimpsest of annotation, if you will. 
that's a tough one. I don't know. <laughs> it's it's an interesting in question in the sense if like the way we have in um, that Andy has curated our reading lists over the summer. It's been we've been going through like different uh, domains of research, domains of expertise, and stuff like that. If we were like thinking through like reading in, in like an ebook or, or something of that sort where it was from snout to tail that's what we would be good doing over the summer then that would make for an interesting uh book review project or something that could be derivative out of that work in that yes there seems to be a lot of uh, uh, potential it's probably early days still right for that um but as annotation we got I think we're we're almost we're coming really close to 20 million annotations uh, now recorded in hypothesis. So there's there is kind of a rich corpus of work there, and of course annotations that are in the public layer, if you will, um, are open to kind of scholarly exploration from like a digital humanities perspective. Um, and so I think there's some there's some future of really interesting work that can be done there. And of course we're we do it uh, in conjunction with uh, you know teachers who are using uh, annotation in a more private class context as well. But of course, that needs to be remain private uh, and isn't open to that kind of analysis as well. I did want to make a small plug here, though, for um, the new research program that Hypothesis has launched um, starting last fall with our scholar in residence, Rami Kalir, who's not here today, although he often is. Um, and uh, that that uh, that program is really going to start to generate out some really interesting formal uh, research about the usage of annotation in different contexts. The first big project is um, with Indiana University focused on um, English and composition uh, uh, use cases, uh, mostly um, in these kind of like, uh, you know, 101 classes, their introductory classes for composition and, and literature. Um, Franny's sharing some links there in the chat about that. So that would be really cool. Um, and I'll just also uh, point out to our attendees that um, if you all have questions or observations, happy to hear, put them in the chat, um, or we can even like give you the mic and uh, let you take, take up some space on the stage as well. Um, I've been asking you some crazy questions and so forth. Was there, was there something, and maybe start with Andy, was there something that you really wanted to make sure that we talked about today that we haven't touched on yet? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, Arun, Haley, is there anything that, that you particularly would like to talk about? Um, I, I think it'd be interesting to kind of talk about uh, like carrying this through, uh, through COVID and through kind of uh, the large transition to online teaching and whether, whether either of you have have noticed any changes with that or have any any thoughts uh, but i i'm loving this conversation thus far uh after doing the dh reads group um, i was like very enthused about it and took it to my home department and where um i'm in the middle of, of getting my qualifying exam readings together and like pitched it to my peers it's like we can do our qualifying exam readings on on high uh, on hypothesis where we each of us could you know see what each other's readings because it's a solitary reading practice it didn't go as well as i thought it would in the sense that there is apprehension in how it is that you know to disclose my uh you know journal thoughts is that something that you want people to do so like that's something I've been trying to think through. It's like, how do you, like the technology is, is easily, it's like, hey, have you used Genius? It's exactly like Genius. And they like, I had the pitch already, but it didn't happen. And that was what's like, why did it not happen? And, and trying to think through what makes this, so like I had mentioned, like vulnerable and, and like placing yourself out there. What is it about that that makes, that you know have to get past. Yeah, I had a, a similar kind of move of like taking this forward. I ended up, you know, I didn't teach in the spring. I was on a research fellowship. And so the summer was kind of my opportunity to get back in the game, if you will. And I ended up bringing hypothesis into the classroom over the fall. 
Um, and it, it worked really well, I think, with students, especially because our classes are fully remote and they're fully synchronous, but they're doing asynchronous work at the same time. So getting to read together, walk through text together was a lot easier using Hypothesis, which is definitely something I was worried about. I saw a lot of those tutorials about how can you set up your phone to be a document camera. Um, it, it wasn't going to happen for me. So using something like this was really helpful and it's something I'll continue into the spring. And I felt like because I had used it through DH Reads, I not only had done sort of the generic like troubleshooting that you do as an instructor when you're bringing something into the classroom, but also as a user, I'd figured out, you know, what are the things that I like to do? How do I like to work through this? And the sign up process was really easy to use. So having kind of had all of this experience with it over the summer, Thanks to Andy and the group, it it was really easy, I think, to migrate into the classroom. I would echo that, and I, I'm thrilled that you used it in your class and such. Um, I, I did the same with my class this past fall. Um, I've been very excited to bring Hypothesis into the class, uh, but with us being entirely online and having the option to be asynchronous or synchronous or mixed, uh, I ended up doing a mix, uh, but so often, so often in our synchronous conversations, it was hard to get, uh, really get students engaged, get them to turn their cameras on, get them to, to speak, anything along that line. And I found particularly uh, in the asynchronous annotations of hypothesis, particularly on the weeks where I put in the labor and I put annotations in and I really showed I cared and was following up. Uh, folks had a lot of engagement. Folks had uh, a lot of connections to the text, a lot of connections to uh, some of the other things that we'd done throughout the semester. And that was that was terrific. And I think additionally, in setting up the course, um, using Hypothesis and knowing that I was going to be using Hypothesis was a good encouragement for me uh, to make sure that things were open, and I try to uh, I try to make sure that I'm I'm providing readings, doing things like that that are open uh, to begin with. But using Hypothesis was was furthermore of an encouragement for that. Of hey, I need to make sure that any of my students can access this. They're they're able to uh, not pay for this, etc. Right, so there was like a, an extra affordance built into it to move toward at least openly available text as well. You know, this kind of brings up, I want to hinge off something that Karen uh, said in the chat about, um, you know, just changing the nature of reading itself, going back a little bit to this idea of our relationships to books changing. Um, and this idea of um, scaffolding uh, both teacher and student experiences into social annotation, like how to, how to do that. I know that, um, uh, if you guys are familiar with Amanda LaCastro, who's another um, practitioner uh, in the social annotation space, who just recently moved from Stevenson to UPenn. Um, and she's actually in the library there, Andy, so she's joined your, your world. <laughs> um, although she was an English teacher before, so that's an interesting move. You don't often see that. Um, <clears throat> but she talked a lot about having bringing students um, uh, first through a private annotation experience with just a group so that they could kind of get their feet wet with the idea of how to like have that vulnerability, like Arun was talking about and so forth, um, and practice that and then build them toward uh, uh, an activity where they would maybe annotate more fully in public once they felt more confident. And the, the reason I wanted to hook it to what Karen was saying is she's thinking about this idea of like, does this mean that we need to read more slowly? Um, and that makes me think too of the pandemic where we're all trying to juggle like what is the right amount of reading to assign probably like and I think I've heard from some students that it seems like some teachers have gone too far and are assigning even more when maybe the circumstances of the pandemic should be asking all of us to maybe assign less. And so maybe there's a little kernel in here that I'm trying to reach for where reading less more slowly might be an interesting way to approach that not I don't know if, <laughs> I don't know who to toss that one to I see nodding heads. I, I mean, the way I might think that through is it's it's not just reading the text. It's like uh, how our social, cultural 
reading practices look like right now. We don't just watch a TV show. You got to, you know, have the build up to the TV show and then you got to go find out what was spoken about it. And so in that way, we don't just consume text in isolation anymore. It's the recognition as educators that these texts come with paratexts that the reader is consuming. So, the, so annotations are a way, social annotations are a way to recognize that and to fold that in to teaching praxis, which was happening in other spaces anyway. And if that is incorporated into it, that could change, you know, the way that teachers are thinking about reading. It's like if, if every bit of, of literature that you assign comes with other, I mean, fan texts that are associated with it, then let's let's fold that in. And in, and in annotations, it's like, oh, these students are going to generate X number of words along with this as well and account for that and, and count that as reading material as well. I love that idea of thinking about like bringing all of that into the classroom. Let me steal that back. The whole, the whole world has become one giant book club in a sense, right? <laughs> what, about, what about this idea of, um, do you find that um, the, the reading process when you're, when you're using social annotation does become slower in a sense? Does it slow you down as a reader, maybe in a good way? So I think it slows down a bit, but it also, whereas like, let's say the kind of more conventional model of you read something and then you write up a reflection on it or a discussion post on your, on Blackboard or Moodle or Canvas or whatever, uh, instead of do this and then that, it's almost do both at the same time. And so reading through, oh, I've got a thought on this. I'm gonna highlight it. I'm going to provide, uh, provide a comment. And I don't know if that, at least for me, necessarily takes more time. It's just doing both at the same time and really kind of incorporating the two. And I think for me anyways, that gives a richer understanding and more ability to uh, kind of reflect on on small small nuances within a piece as opposed to kind of okay these are the big three things that I want to talk about so I'm going to write them in here if I were to answer that it's the difference in, is like if you're consuming this is a really bad example but but uh, the Hamilton musical you, you and if you had to annotate that, or if you're reading that, it's like, oh, not only are you learning the history of it, then you get a little history of rap lesson there as well. And then you get to find out all the other like details. There's so much of uh, different streams of information from different domains of information that are coming together and being braided in here for you to understand. So rather than being a learner of a subject in isolation, here, that interdisciplinary nature and multidisciplinary nature of work that can be done is more explicit and in out in the open. So it lets all of us be think about how to pivot to thinking in multi and uh, cross disciplinary fashion, I guess. Definitely. And it highlights how situated learning is too, right? That we're all coming to these texts with different expect perspectives, with different experiences, and thinking about them in different ways. You know, approaching a text now together is very different than it was when you were, you know, perhaps in your college dorm room, however many years ago, right? When you're kind of by yourself or maybe sitting in the common room, right? The common room is digital in a lot of ways now. And so thinking about how that looks, especially during a pandemic, especially when many of our students themselves are kind of multitasking at home, caring for family, caring for ourselves. Um, it, it makes the reading process really different. And I love this idea of kind of highlighting that and inviting that into the conversation. Yeah, it would be interesting to start out your course, <laughs> letting students know that you're going to read in a completely different way <laughs> this term than you ever have before, and then really invite that that difference in um, with the memes and the, and the multi-textuality and all that. Um, I guess I, I've always felt like one of the most powerful things about social annotation too is that it takes 
what could be that same conversation that Arun is saying is usually happening somewhere else anyway on Twitter or in the discussion forum, like Andy was saying, but it anchors it like literally on top of discrete passages of the text itself. And I feel like that's one of the most powerful things about it is that the conversation and the text are just really right on top of each other, um, which makes it, you know, more connected, less disassociated, right? From that, like Andy gestured, you know, you go off to write a reflection piece and a lot of times you're gonna do some sort of maybe dry summary because you're not embedded in the, the sort of, you know, close reading of the text itself. Is that, does that seem like it kind of comes out of your experiences as well? I'd say very much. And to add on what you were saying before with kind of multiple layers, I really have loved it when we've had pieces that have either had public annotations or they've been annotated in a class as well as the reading group uh, where there's multiple more layers. There's the text, then there's our reading group, then there's maybe public annotations, then a different. Uh, and it's great to see everyone's different take on that text, on those passages, et cetera. In a way, we're mimicking an older technology, the transparency. Like what a transparency sheet would do on top of a thing is essentially we're recreating over here with, with the social annotation. Yeah, and then adding a little bit of, um, we can do it across time and space in a way that the transparency didn't really afford, right? Oh, Franny is, has popped on. I think she, she wants to say something here. Hi. Uh, yeah, we are nearing the end of the show, but um, if people want to go over, um, if our panelists um, want to hang around and keep this really rich conversation going, that would be great. Um, and but I want to be cognizant of people's time. So if they need to, if you need to leave, uh, you know, feel free to our guests and attendees. Um, yeah, we, we always have places to go, right? Yeah. If you want to stay on the uh, panel, just raise your hand. All right. Wow. And repeat after me. We're <laughs> swearing you in as panelists on Liquid Margins. Yeah, but, to, only uh, on, but only on like a book, a novel, not yeah. on the web. Okay, great. Well, let's keep it going then. Um, for anybody who does have to leave um, from our attendees, uh, thank you so much for coming. And please um, come to the next Liquid Margins. You'll get some notifications about that. We're also always on Twitter promoting the show. So. Yeah, thanks. And you know, that reminded me of um, something I, I did want to um, ask you guys about that I didn't yet. And that's um, so it's kind of like a classic question, but like, what's next for DH <laughs> what, what What's, yeah, I take it that this summer, I mean, we're now in the, you know, just kicking off another, what's going to be probably somewhat difficult term, right? I mean, we got another term of pandemic to, to look at here. Um, are you thinking about uh, another summer activity that's particularly focused on something or what's up next for DH reads? So, I'm very curious to hear other folks' input as uh, if other folks want to take this in different directions, I'm, I'm very excited, uh, excited to do that. Uh, I think for our third year of DH Reads, my plan thus far is to keep it to another summer activity. Uh, that's been fairly intentional. Uh, there had been some discussion uh, and some questions about potentially uh, particularly during COVID, carrying that into the fall term, but we already have so many, uh, so many plates in the air, and I, I didn't really want to kind of put that additional labor on folks. Um, with, with where the pandemic is currently, I think for this next year, we'll probably do something relatively similar to what we did this past year, and uh, try to bring more folks into the fold, try to have more conversations, uh, but not necessarily grow what we're doing. Because again, even though it's during the summer, all sorts of folks will have childcare, they'll have other responsibilities, etc. And, and this is supposed to be fun. It's not supposed to be something that's too much uh, labor. So. Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to uh, make people's experience in this really exciting opportunity look like work, right? 
like more work. I was, uh, I attended, a, uh, I have a high schooler and I attended, a, you know, getting ready to apply for college session with them last night. And um, the, the school structured it. So it was like, probably, I would say a not very well designed Zoom class session where we had to go to breakout rooms and there was an assignment. And I was just like, I could see all the students who were there, their eyes were just glazing over. They're like, we just did this all day and now we have to do it again. Maybe I don't want to go to college, right? So I, I love how uh, the, the energy and creativity that you guys are bringing to this um, makes kind of rekindles my faith that, you know, teaching and learning can be a really exciting, interesting, innovative process that can kind of rekindle your love for books and scholarship in ways that normal schooling might kind of you know, <laughs> empty it out. <laughs> Do you guys feel, you know, more energized about, about your work and your reading? There, there are good days and there are not so. <laughs> In the sense, like, uh, I had, I mean, with the experiences that I had with DH Reads, I wanted to see if it's, oh, is this possible to incorporate it into the learning management system that's at uh, my school? But then I realized it's like there, it's the tech department that, you know, that deals with that sort of thing. And uh, it, it's a very Sisyphean task to engage it, to be able to do it in that context. So uh, in small spaces, uh, yes, it's, it's, uh, there's innovative things that can be done, but to build a coalition building takes time and uh, like to get everybody else on board uh, to make it work. Yeah, there's effort and time that goes into that. I think one of the big things for for me with it is it it gives me an opportunity to really read a lot of the great work in in our discipline uh, that's stuff that I've been wanting to read but haven't necessarily had the chance to. There's always so many other things on the docket and uh, having having the opportunity specifically carved out to delve into four texts and then for me some time beforehand to really kind of look at some other texts and kind of vet them to uh, to have in this uh, is is absolutely invaluable sort of giving you an excuse to do something that you wanted to do anyway, right? Sorry, Haley, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just gonna say, I think because we're often siloed in our individual disciplines too, or our individual jobs, doing something like DH Reads lets us kind of put feelers out into the field more broadly, this large field of, of digital humanities, of digital learning, um, of social annotation and thinking about, you know, what else is happening out there? How does my work connect to it? How might I get involved in these conversations? Yeah, it strikes me that digital humanities obviously is interdisciplinary sort of at its root across the humanities, of course, right? But there's also a way in which it reaches across the sort of, um, like Arun was gesturing toward across the sort of, uh, you know, at least computer science and uh, humanities realms, right? And makes connections there that maybe weren't as common in the past. Um, is that, do you guys, have you found yourselves all, I don't know the degree to which you think of yourselves as technologists too, but have you found yourselves chipping toward huh, technology or data related things that you might not have before having been an English teacher or something like that? I mean, I'll say yes. It, and, and it's a very slow chipping. It's like very, very slow. Um, but doing things like exactly, exactly that gesture, Nate. It's you know doing things like DH reads, attending things like DHSI, the Digital Humanities Summer Institute, being on social media, seeing these conversations that folks are having in um, ed tech or digital pedagogy has been, I think, a huge part of my growth as a, a scholar and learner, um, and also, you know, getting to be a part of the world and thinking about these conversations and seeing you know what else can I learn? How can I incorporate that into my teaching and learning and just general interest? So very slow chipping. Like if, if the teaching profession had a certain amount of care work that you had to do with it, when it moved to like online teaching, there the care work look turned into tech support. And where all of a sudden, in order to be able to do your teaching 
you had to do tech support, but not in a very co consumerist way, but if it's like, okay, you have to teach these people how to use this tech in order to move them along. And there it's, it's tech support as care work. That becomes a different kind of thing, which you don't find in other domains. That's a skill set that, that we had to acquire like in, in the last yeah, year and a bit, I suppose, yeah. So it wasn't data science necessarily, it was how to use Zoom or something. <laughs> yeah, understood. Yeah, I was just uh, thinking I interviewed a bunch of community college students about their experience in the pandemic and, and sort of like what Haley was saying, one thing that they all said that regardless of what else had happened with their, their you know, their learning across the, the spring term, this was last spring, the one thing that they had all gained was like deeper skills and facility with technology just because they had to sort of, and they actually felt like in many ways that was the most valuable thing that happened to them because it also helped prepare them for um, the working world where obviously we have to use this stuff too. Well, I see we're getting really close to the top of the hour here and this has just been a great conversation. I could talk to you guys all day and I would love to do that, but we probably have other things we need to do. So I'll just, um, one more time is if there's anything anybody else wants to say, um, I'll just call on you one at a time. Oh, say yeah. it and say goodbye uh, as we go through it. So Haley, uh, you, what's your last thought and sign off? Just thank you to Nate and Franny and everyone at Liquid Margins for putting this together, inviting us. And thank you to Andy and Arun and the, the DH Reads community for being so welcoming and for doing this work. Join us. Thanks for coming, Haley. Arun, what's what's your sign off? Uh, thank you to the Liquid Margins crew and the Hypothesis crew for the amazing tool that you have provided us. And uh, thank you for the H Reads community that uh, Andy and, and uh, the team has put together. It's It's been lovely to see how uh, we can use tech in a way that, that makes us feel not isolated in a in a time where that seems to be you know in the word so that takes a lot of effort and thanks for that you are much appreciated okay andy the final word is yours i'll try not to sound like a an oscar speech here with too many thank yous uh but um first off uh thank you again to uh the liquid margins crew for having us on Thank you for Hypothesis. It's an absolutely fantastic tool, and I DH Reads would not be the same without it. Uh, and it's been great in the classroom. Uh, thank you to Arun and Haley for being here today, as well as Michael Albani is one of our uh, attendees. Uh, Michael was a regular DH Reads individual for this past year, and uh, we we're so glad to have you with us today as well. Uh, and then I guess my final thing is uh, we hope to have folks join us. So this next year, it'll be hashtag DHreads21. And uh, feel free to, to message any of us. Uh, sorry to speak for, for both of you, but feel free to speak or feel free to message me at least um, if you're interested in joining or participating. Uh, we hope to have you. Thank you. We'll definitely, thanks, thanks for all your kind words, all of you, uh, and we'll definitely be sharing the recording from this session out with um, some DH Reads uh, Twitter handles and hashtags attached. Really appreciate your coming out, and I um, guess we'll be excited to see what happens uh, going forward. Don't ever hesitate to reach out to anybody on the Hypothesis team if you run into issues or troubles or questions. Um, we're, we're there to help. Um, we got a whole other bunch of people behind us, too, that are, are even wiser than us about things. Um, so. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Really appreciate your coming.